Come on, Gav. Wake up. Paddington. Uh, uh, come on. Here. You all right? Uh, Let's take a look at you. Blimey. You've lost a bit of blood, haven't you? I'm good with a proper bandage, that's for sure. Now, don't worry. I'm just getting this handkerchief out of the way. And we can see what the truck. No. The Engineer's Thumb by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised for radio by Peter Mackey. With Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson. And featuring Stephen Tomkinson as Victor Hatherley and John Moffat as Colonel Lysander Stark. The Engineer's Thumb. Of all the problems which have been submitted to my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, for solution during the years of our intimacy, there were only two which I was the means of introducing to his notice, that of Mr. Hatherley's thumb and that of Colonel Warburton's madness. Of these, the latter may have afforded a finer field for an acute and original observer, but the other was so strange in its inception and so dramatic in its details that it may be the more worthy of being placed upon record, even if it gave my friend fewer openings for those deductive methods of reasoning by which he achieves such remarkable results. The story has, I believe, been told more than once in the newspapers, but like all such narratives, its effect is much less striking when set forth on block in a single half-column of print than when the facts slowly evolve before your own eyes and the mystery clears gradually away as each new discovery furnishes a step which leads on to the complete truth. At the time, the circumstances made a deep impression upon me and the lapse of two years has hardly served to weaken the effect. By the late summer of 89, not long after my marriage, I had returned to civil practice and finally abandoned Holmes in his Baker Street rooms. As I happened to live at no great distance from Paddington Station, I got a few patients from amongst the officials there. One of these, whom I had cured of a painful and lingering disease, was never weary of advertising my virtues and of endeavouring to send me on every sufferer over whom he might have any influence. One morning, at a little before seven o'clock, I was awakened by the maid tapping at the door to announce that two men had come from Paddington and were waiting in the consulting room. I dressed hurriedly, for I knew by experience railway cases were seldom trivial. As I hastened down the stairs, my old ally, the guard, came out of the consulting room and closed the door behind him. Morning, Doctor. Morning. I've, uh, I've put him in there for you. Uh, I thought it for the best. Uh, yes, of course, but uh, what exactly is right? Uh, a new patient. I wanted to bring him round myself. Uh, very thoughtful of you. I'd uh, better get back if that's all the same to you. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, and uh, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Morning to you. Uh, morning. <clears throat> right. Sorry to have kept you waiting. My name's Watson. I'm sorry to have knocked you up so early. Oh, that's quite all right, Mr... Uh... Hatherley. Victor Hatherley. I believe your maid left my card in the hall. Oh, I'm afraid I... It would also tell you that I'm a hydraulic engineer. What can I do for you, Mr Hatherley? I came in by train this morning to Paddington. Ah, oh, night journey can be monotonous. Now, if you... Oh, my just night tell me could not be called monotonous. <laughs> I have had a serious accident, you see. Well, it's hardly the sort of thing that happens every night. That will do, Mr. Hatherley. Well, just as well, eh? Just as well. Do you see? Eh? Do you see? Stop it. Do you see? Stop it! I, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I, I seem to have made rather a fool of myself. Drink this. That's it. All of it. That's better. Now, sit down. Thank you. And now, Doctor, perhaps you would kindly attend to my thumb. Put your hand on the table. That's it. Good heavens. Or rather, the place where my thumb used to be. This is a terrible injury. 
Must have bled considerably. <laughs> yes, it did. I fainted when it was done. When I came to, I found that it was still bleeding, so I tied my handkerchief round my wrist and braced it up with a twig. Excellent. You should have been a surgeon. Uh, well, it's a question of hydraulics, you see, and came within my own province. Mm. This has been done by a very heavy and sharp instrument. A thing like a cleaver. An accident, I presume. No, by no means. I was attacked. Attacked? Doctor, I have been through quite an ordeal. Perhaps you'd better not speak of the matter. It is evidently trying to your nerves. Well, I think I'm over that now. And I shall have to tell my tale to the police. But between ourselves, if it were not for the convincing evidence of this wound of mine, I should be surprised if they believe my statement. Hmm? I've not much in the way of proof to back it up. And even if they do believe me, the clues which I can give them are so vague, it is a question whether justice will be done. If it's in the nature of a problem to be solved, I strongly recommend you to come to my friend, Mr Sherlock Holmes. Oh, yes. I've heard of that fellow. I should be very glad if he would take the matter up. Would you give me an introduction to him? I'll do better. I'll take you round to him myself. I should be immensely obliged to you. That's settled then. Yeah. How does that feel? Capital. I'll get the maid to call a cab. With a bit of luck, we'll just be in time for breakfast. When we arrived at Baker Street, Sherlock Holmes was, as I expected, lounging about the sitting room in his dressing gown, reading the agony column of the Times and smoking his before breakfast pipe. As ever, this was composed of all the plugs and dottles left from his smokes from the day before, all carefully dried and collected on the corner of the mantelpiece. He received us in his quietly genial fashion, ordered fresh rashers and eggs, and joined us in a hearty meal. More bacon, Mr Hatherley? No, I must admit to being full. Thank you, Mr Holmes. I've felt another man since the doctor bandaged me, and I think that your breakfast has completed the cure. It is easy to say that your experience has been no common one. Might I suggest, before you acquaint us with the detail of the ordeal you have undergone, you stretch yourself out on the sofa there? Well, I... I... Uh, please, I insist. Very well. I think perhaps you may be right, and I'm not yet quite as steady as I should be. Here, a pillow for your head. And brandy and water on the side table. You may feel the need of a further stimulant. Thank you. Now, Mr Hatherley, you have our full attention. Well, gentlemen, I feel I must take up as little of your valuable time as possible. You must know, however, that I am an orphan and a bachelor residing alone in lodgings in London and, by profession, a hydraulic engineer. Two years ago, having served my time and also having come into a fair sum of money through my poor father's death, I determined to start in business for myself and took professional chambers in Victoria Street. I suppose that everyone finds his first independent start a dreary experience, but to me it has been exceptionally so. During two years, I have had three consultations, one small job and gross takings of £27.10. shillings. So you can well imagine how I gradually came to believe I should never have any practice at all. I should think we all felt like that at one time or another. Hey, Holmes. <laughs> uh, please continue, Mr Hatherley. Yesterday, however, just as I was thinking of leaving the office, my clerk entered to say that there was a gentleman waiting to see me on business. A Colonel Lysander Stark. Close at his heels came the Colonel himself. A man rather over the middle size, but of an exceeding thinness. I do not think I have ever seen so thin a man. Yet this emaciation seemed to be his natural habit, and due to no disease, for his eye was bright, his step brisk, and his bearing assured. Mr. Hetherley? Colonel Stark, please take a seat. Thank you. What can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Hetherley, you have been recommended to me as a man who is not only proficient in his profession, but is also discreet and capable of preserving a secret. I have it from the same source that you are both an orphan and a bachelor, 
and are residing alone in London. That is correct, but I fail to see how all this bears on my professional qualifications, presuming that it is a professional matter on which you wish to speak to me. Undoubtedly so. I have a commission for you, but secrecy is essential, absolute secrecy. If I promise to keep a secret, you may absolutely depend on my doing so. Do you promise then? Yes, I promise. Absolute and complete silence before, during and after? No reference to the matter at all, either in word or writing? Colonel Stark, please state to your business. My time is of value. Hmm. How would 50 guineas for a night's work suit you? Um, yes, that would suit most admirably. I say a night's work, but... An hour's would be near the mark. I simply want your opinion on a hydraulic machine which has got out of gear. If you show us what is wrong, we shall soon set it right ourselves. What do you think of such a commission as that? Most acceptable. And then you will come tonight by the last train. Where to? Eiffold, in Berkshire. There is a train from Paddington which would bring you there at about 11.15. I shall come down in a carriage to meet you. There is a drive then? Oh, yes. We are quite out in the country, a good seven miles from Eiffel Station. I doubt if there is a train back at that hour. Could I not come at some more convenient time? We have judged it best you should come late. It is to recompense you for any inconvenience that we are paying you, a young and unknown man, a fee which would buy an opinion from the very heads of your profession. Of course, if you would like to draw out of the business, there's plenty of time to do so. Not at all. I shall be very happy to accommodate myself to your wishes. I should like, however, to understand a little more clearly what it is that you wish me to do. Quite so. As you are probably aware, Fuller's Earth is a valuable product that is only found in one or two places in England. I have heard, sir. Some little time ago, I bought a small place, a very small place, within ten miles of Reading. I was fortunate enough to discover that there was a deposit of Fuller's Earth in one of my fields. On examining it, however, I found that this deposit was a comparatively small one and that it formed a link between two very much larger ones upon the right and the left. Both of them, however, in the grounds of my neighbours. These good people were absolutely ignorant that their land contained that which was quite as valuable as a gold mine. Or naturally, it was to my interest to buy their land before they discovered its true value, but unfortunately I had no capital by which I could do this. I took a few of my friends into the secret, however, and they suggested that we should quietly and secretly work our own little deposit and that in this way we should earn the money which would enable us to buy the neighbouring fields. This we have now been doing for some time, and in order to help us in our operations, we erected a hydraulic press. This press, as I have already explained, has got out of order, and we wish your advice upon the subject. We guard our secret very jealously, however, and if it once became known that we had hydraulic engineers coming to our little house, it would soon rouse inquiry, and then, if the facts came out, it would be goodbye to any chance of getting these fields and carrying out our plans. Yes, of course. Exactly what type of machine are you using? All will be made perfectly clear tonight. Mr. Hetherley, I have now taken you fully into my confidence. I trust I may expect you at Eiffel at 11.15? I shall certainly be there. Yes, I am sure you will. But please remember, you must not speak one word of this to another soul. Not one word. As you can well imagine, Mr. Holmes, I was delighted at being offered a fee which was at least tenfold what I should have asked had I set a price on my own services. On the other hand, the manner of my patron had made an unpleasant impression on me. But you decided to throw caution to the wind. Quite so, Doctor. I caught the last train to Eiford as arranged and got there shortly after eleven. Well, there was no one else on the platform save a somewhat sleepy porter. Certainly no Colonel Lysander Stark. 
As I passed through the dimly lit wicket gate, however, I found my acquaintance of the morning waiting in the shadow upon the other side. Without a word, he grasped my arm and hurried me to a waiting carriage. No, the carriage. One horse? Yes. Hmm. Tired looking or fresh? Fresh and glossy. Thank you. I'm sorry to have interrupted. Uh, pray continue. We drove for at least an hour. It was only supposed to have been seven miles, but from the rate that we seemed to go and the time that we took, I should think that it must have been nearer twelve. All the time, Colonel Stark sat there in silence, and I was aware that he was looking at me with great intensity. I tried to see out of the windows, but they were made of frosted glass. And when we eventually arrived at the house, he pulled me straight from the carriage into the porch, and I failed to catch even the most fleeting glance of the property. The instant that I crossed the threshold, I heard the faint rattle of the wheels as the carriage was driven away. Then, as the door was slammed heavily behind us, I found myself standing apprehensively in the pitch dark of what I assumed to be some sort of hallway. Uh, just give me a moment, Hesley. Ah, uh, oh, I can't seem to get this lamp. Ah, that's better. Was geht hier wohl? Hier so rock und mach die Tür zu. Was ist denn das? Das geht dich nicht an. Now, Mr. Heffley, if you will be so kind as to wait in here, I shall not keep you long. Colonel Stark placed the lamp on the table and then slipped quietly back into the hallway, shutting the door behind him. I walked across to the window, hoping I might catch some glimpse of the countryside, but a heavily barred oak shutter was folded across it. It was a wonderfully silent house. There was an old clock ticking loudly somewhere in the passage, but otherwise everything was deadly still. A vague feeling of uneasiness began to steal over me. Who were these German people? And what were they doing living in this strange, out-of-the-way place? And where was the place? I was ten miles or so from Eiford. That was all I knew. But whether north, south, east or west, I had no idea. For that matter, Reading and possibly other large towns were within that radius, so the place might not be so secluded after all. Yet it was quite certain from the absolute stillness that we were in the country. I paced up and down the room, humming a tune under my breath to keep up my spirits and feeling that I was thoroughly earning my fifty-guinea fee. I'm full in the hydraulic. Metal verabaitung. Ah, Colonel. I'm sorry. The woman was standing in the doorway, the darkness of the hall behind her, the yellow light from my lamp beating upon her eager and beautiful face. I could see at a glance that she was sick with fear, and the sight sent a chill to my own heart. Shh, no noise. But... Please, you go. You not stay here. There is no good for you here. But who are you? What is this place? Go quickly. No one stops you. But I came here to do a job. For love of heaven, get away before it is too late. But I am somewhat headstrong by nature, and the more ready to engage in an affair when there is some obstacle in the way. I thought again of my fifty-guinea fee, of my wearisome journey, and of the unpleasant night which seemed to be before me. Was it all to go for nothing? Why should I slink away without having carried out my commission, and without the payment which was my due? This woman might, for all I knew, be a monomaniac. But surely you must tell me. I what... hope this fellow knows his stuff. I must not stay. He would appear to be well qualified. But who are you and what are you. Right, let's have a word with him then. I'm sorry to uh, have kept you waiting, Mr. Henry. Uh, this is Mr. Ferguson, my secretary and manager. Pleased to meet you. Hatherley. We will take you up to see the machine now. I'd better get my hat then. No need. It's inside the house. You dig fuller's earth in the house? No. This is only where we compress it. Compress it? But why should no, you... Never mind all that. All we wish you to do is examine the machine and tell us where it is at fault. Come. And holding the lamp, the Colonel led the way up to the second floor. It was a labyrinth of an old house, with corridors, passages, narrow winding staircases and low doors. There were no carpets or signs of any furniture above the ground floor. 
while the plaster was peeling off the walls and the damp was breaking through in green, unhealthy blotches. I tried to put on as unconcerned an air as possible, despite the unexpected and dramatic warning I had been given by the German woman. The growing fear within me, however, was suddenly forgotten as Colonel Stark stopped before a low door, unlocked it, and led me into a small square room, too small, in fact, to hold the three of us at any one time, and Ferguson remained outside. I'm sure all this is quite familiar to you, Mr. Hethley. Yes, of course. The ceiling of this chamber is really the end of the descending piston which comes down with a force of many tons on this metal floor. <laughs> it would be a particularly unpleasant thing for us if anyone were to turn it on. <laughs> it is somewhat bigger than I had expected. What do you mean? I had anticipated a smaller machine. Would you show me the mechanism now? Very well. It works readily enough, but... There seems to be some stiffness in its action, and there is definitely a loss of force. Ferguson would explain. Certainly. Uh, these are the small lateral columns of water that receive the force and then transmit and multiply it uh, in the usual way. You know all about this, of course. Well, yes. Perhaps it would be better if I could just examine the machinery. I doubt if it will take long. There's certainly nothing fundamentally wrong with the mechanism. From what you say, it could well be one of the piston cylinders. Do you think you could start it up, Mr. Ferguson? Certainly. All right, that's enough. Yes, yeah, just as I thought. The fault is in one of the cylinders. Is it serious? Well, not particularly. That is, you can carry on working the machine, but I would advise you to get a replacement as soon as possible. Mm. Could we fit this ourselves? Well, certainly. It's, it's this cylinder here. The seal around the driving head must have shrunk and has obviously led to some slight leakage, allowing a regurgitation of water through one of the side cylinders. Mm. How do we replace it? Well, you'd have to drain off, of course. Then it's quite simple. You take off the air accumulator here. Well, that gives you access to the piston and, well, you just change the seal. And that is the only problem? As far as I can tell. In that case, I may as well go and see if we have a spare of some kind. Look, uh, Colonel, if it's all the same to you, I'm just going to take another look in the chamber, just to make sure. Very well. That seems all right in here. Of course, if you do have a spare seal and some tools, I could easily fit it for you. Oh, I'd take no time at all. No time at all. Well, certainly no more than an hour. What are you doing there? I was just wondering what was in the floor trough here. It's certainly not full as earth. Is that so? Colonel Stark, I feel you might have more confidence in me. Surely I should be in a better position to advise on your machine if I knew the exact purpose for which it was being used. Very well. You shall know all about the machine. No, 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 wait. Open this door. Do you hear me? Hello, I said open this door. No, no, Colonel, no, let me out. Let me out, let me out. I was gripped by a blind terror as I saw by the light of the lamp I had placed on the floor that the black ceiling was coming down upon me. Slowly, jerkily, but as none knew better than myself, with a force which must within a minute grind me to a shapeless pulp. I threw myself at the door again and dragged with my nails at the lock. Let me out, please, please! But I doubt if they even heard my cries above that remorseless clanking. The ceiling was now only a foot or two above my head, and as I felt its rough, hard surface, it flashed through my mind that the pain of my death would depend very much on the position in which I met it. If I lay on my face, the weight would come down upon my spine, and I shuddered to think of that dreadful snap. Easier the other way, perhaps. And yet, had I the nerve to lie and look up at that deadly black shadow wavering down upon me? Already I was unable to stand erect. 
But then my eye caught something which brought a gush of hope back to my heart. A thin yellow line of light suddenly appeared between two of the boards that made up the wooden walls, broadening rapidly as a small panel was pushed backwards. Within a few moments, the boards had been caught beneath the jaw of the machine, and the gap had widened sufficiently for me to hurl myself through to lay half fainting on the other side. Come, quickly! But who are you? Please, they will see you are not there. I you wanted to kill me. Not now. You wanted to kill me. You must come. I help you. Yes, yes, quickly now, quickly. Uh, I'm not sure if it's exactly the right size, but uh, this seal might do the trick. Although from what I heard just then, the press seemed to work rather well. You are right. It did work well. Still, we can't afford to take any chances. Best change it as soon as... Uh, what's happened to Hatherley? You will see soon enough. No, I don't believe it. You may believe what you like. I told you this was never to happen again. You tell me nothing. I am in charge here. You do as I say. Our young friend was too curious. But surely we, we could have... Well, anything, anything but this. We had to be stopped. And now... You must help me to get rid of the... Nine. He clouded us. I see. Uh, he will not have got far. We better make sure that. No, 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 there is no time. We must find him. Come! But why? Why do they want to kill me? Do you not understand? Please, now they will know you are not there. I go down the stairs. You look up here. Oh, please, they are coming. Who are you? Why are you doing this? There is no time. Where are you taking Hurry. me? No sign of him up here. Stay by the stairs. He is still in the house. They are coming. In here. As she spoke, a light sprang into view at the far end of the passage, and I saw the lean figure of Colonel Lysander Stark rushing forward with a lantern in one hand and something gleaming in the other. Down here, quickly. At the window. It's your own house. Uh, lock the door. There is no key. Oh, it's stuck. I'm, I'm not sure Honey. I... Honey. Uh, there. You must jump. Now. But what about you? Oh, you are stupid. Jump. I'm not going to just leave you. Get out of my way. No, you must not. Remember your promise. I said get out of my way. He will be silent. I know it. You will be the of us. Please, please. No. I had by now no. maneuvered myself to the outside of the window. And as Stark pushed the woman aside and rushed across the room, I lowered myself so that I was hanging full length with my hands grasping the sill. Oh, Fritz! My last impression of Stark was a face distorted with fury and the cleaver he was holding descending towards me. As I let go, I was conscious of a dull pain. I was shaken but not hurt by the fall, so I picked myself up and rushed off among the bushes as hard as I could run. Suddenly, however, a deadly dizziness and sickness came over me. I glanced down at my hand, which was throbbing painfully, and then, for the first time, saw that my thumb had been cut off and that the blood was pouring from the wound. Despite my now delirious state, I realized that a tourniquet would have to be applied as quickly as possible, and I achieved this with my handkerchief and a twig that was lying on the ground. Then there came a sudden buzzing in my ears, and the next moment I fell in a dead faint. How long were you unconscious? I could not tell, but it must have been a long time, as it was quite light when I came to myself. Where were you when you regained consciousness? <sighs> that is the strangest part of the whole affair. When I first came to, naturally, I, I sprang to my feet, feeling that I might hardly yet be safe from my pursuers. But to my astonishment, when I looked round me, neither house nor garden were to be seen. Extraordinary. I found instead that I had been lying in an angle of a hedge close by the high road, and looking further I could see it was close by the very station at which I had arrived a few hours before. Were it not for the ugly wound upon my hand, all that had passed during those dreadful hours might have been an evil dream. Mr. Holmes? Uh, uh, please, carry on. I, I seem to recall a reference. 
As luck would have it, the same porter was on duty. I asked him if he remembered the carriage that had been waiting for me the night before, but he could not recall it. But he must have known of Colonel Stark. The name meant nothing to him. When I learned that the nearest police station was about three miles away, I decided to wait for the first train of the day to Paddington. I was determined to tell the authorities my story as quickly as possible, but, well, as you know, Doctor, I came to you first, mm. and you were kind enough to bring me along here. Gentlemen, I, I put my case in your hands and shall do exactly what you advise. Oh, we will certainly do everything in our power to get to the bottom of this mystery, eh, Holmes? Holmes? What? <coughs> Oh, yes, 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 of course. Ah, here is the cutting. An advertisement that appeared in all the papers about a year ago. I think it should interest you. Lost on the ninth inst, Mr. Jeremiah Hailing, age 26, a hydraulic engineer. Left his lodgings at 10 o'clock at night and has not been heard of since, was dressed in a... etc., etc. What do you make of that, Watson? I fancy it may represent the last time the Colonel needed to have his machine overhauled. Undoubtedly. It is quite clear that Colonel Lysander Stark is a cool and desperate man who is determined that nothing will stand in the way of his little game. How are you feeling now, Mr. Hatherley? Oh, much better, thank you. Are you up to returning to Iford? Certainly. I shall accompany you naturally. Watson. Mm, yes, of course. And a plain clothes man from Scotland Yard, I fancy. Oh, we will call there on the way to the station. Well, gentlemen. It must be a year or more since I've been to Berkshire. If Mr. Hatherley's most unfortunate experience is anything to go by, that is far too long. Mr. Holmes? Oh, Mr. Holmes. Ah, good day to you, Bradstreet. Came as quick as I could. They sent your message on to me. Excellent. Although I wasn't sure. Uh, that is, I thought I might have missed you. No, your timing is impeccable. Nearly five minutes to spare. Ah, that's all right, then. Yeah, perhaps I should have brought one or two constables along, you know, reinforcements, as oh, it were. Oh, I'm sure we shall be able to cope, as long as there are no more than, say, four in the gang. Four? Oh, forgive me, Bradstreet. Dr. Watson will be with us. Oh, I see. Together with a young gentleman who had the misfortune to sustain an accident last night, and the further misfortune of suffering a recurrence of the bleeding a few minutes ago. Oh, yes. Watson's taken him to the first aid post. <laughs> He'll be with us shortly. So, you really think it's the same gang, then? Oh, a distinct possibility, Bradstreet. No more than that. Yes, of course, I understand. It's just that, well, I've been after them far too long not to want to be in at the kill. Which is precisely why I invited you to join us. Very generous of you, Mr Holmes. And I can assure you that that will be in my report. Let us hope you will have something to report. Ah, there's Watson. Even if we don't have any luck on this occasion, I'd just like you to know I appreciate the favour. Mm. Uh, morning, Dr Watson. Morning, Bradstreet. May I introduce Victor Hatherley? Inspector Bradstreet. How do you do, sir? Uh, forgive me if I don't shake hands, Inspector, as you see. Uh, I understand, sir. Everything all right, Watson? Oh, I would say so. It looked a lot worse than it really was. Yes, I think you'll do. In which case, I suggest we board our train, gentlemen. And if you have no objections, I would prefer a smoker. There are still one or two points that may benefit from our further consideration. How much longer, Watson? No more than... Four or five minutes. We seem to be on time. So, there's no doubt in your mind, Bradstreet. None whatsoever. Coiners. Coiners on a large scale. They must have used the hydraulic press to form their amalgam. And they've been turning out half crowns by the thousand. And we even traced them as far as Reading. They must have covered their trace as well as we couldn't get any further. Now, thanks to this lucky chance, I think we've got them right enough. <laughs> Not so lucky for you, of course, uh, Mr. Hatherley. How are you feeling, by the way? I shall be fine. That's the ticket. What I cannot understand is why they should have spared you when they found you lying fainting in the garden. Perhaps the villain was softened by the woman's entreaties, eh? I hardly think that likely. When Stark came at me with that cleaver, he wanted me dead. We had better take a look at that map of yours, Bradstreet. Yeah. See if we can pinpoint the house. Uh, you said about 12 miles, didn't you, sir? It was certainly a good hour's drive. Well, as you can see, I've drawn a circle at a 12-mile radius around Iford. <laughs> the Lord only knows where we start searching, though. I think I could lay my finger on it. Uh, I might have known you would have formed an opinion, Mr Holmes. Come now, we shall see who agrees with you. I'd say the house lies to the south, or more deserted there. Mr Hatherley? I think... Yes, I will say the east. There look to be several quiet villages out that way. I'm for the north. No hills there, you see. 
And Hathaway says he did not notice the carriage going uphill. So, Mr. Holmes, north, south and east are gone. What do you say? You're all wrong. Then it's the west. Not at all. This is where we shall find them. But there can only be five minutes' walk from the station homes. I believe you may be right. And the 12-mile drive? Simple. Six out and six back. You said yourself the horse was fresh and glossy. Yes, it's a likely enough ruse. We're agreed, then. We'll start our search in Iford. Though exactly where we look, your guess is as good as mine. May I suggest, gentlemen, that you start by looking out of the window? Keep back there! Keep back! Quite a place, indeed. I should imagine they can see the smoke from several miles away. Well, Mr. Hathaway, this drive, the bushes, and... Well, yes, that second-floor window. That must have been the one I jumped from. Well, this is the house, all right. Not for much longer, I shouldn't think. Roof looks set to go at any moment. If it's any consolation, Hathaway, at least you have had your revenge on them. It was probably your oil lamp that set fire to the place when it was crushed by the press. Your friends of last night were too excited in the chase to observe it at the time. Keep back there now! Keep back with the others! All right, Constable. These gentlemen are with me. Really? And who might you be, then? Inspector Bradstreet, Scotland Yard. Thank your pardon, sir. I, I didn't know. Uh, local man, are you? Fielding, sir. What do you know about all this? Oh, not much, sir. Fire broke out in the night, I reckon. Whose house is it? Belongs to a Dr. Beecher. Thin man, is he? Sharp features, German accent. Uh, no, sir. Dr. Beecher is an Englishman. There isn't a man in the parish who has a better line waistcoat. Must be that manager fellow, Ferguson. What about the woman? There was no woman there. At least not to my knowledge. But there was a gentleman staying with him. A patient, as I understand it. A foreigner. Looked as though a nice drop of good Berkshire beef wouldn't do him any harm either. I dare say Colonel Lysander Stark and his colleagues are all at least a hundred miles away by now and possibly enjoying the culinary delights of some other county. Or oh, country. I'm clear! The roof! It is going! Keep back now! Everybody get back! Watch out for that ceiling, Bert. All right to take a look in here. Oh, uh, just be careful, sir. A little bit hot. We haven't finished setting down yet. Come on! What's the hold-up down there? Oh. So, what do you think then, Mr. Hatherley? I, I hardly know what to say. Well, this is it, all right. Good heavens. Yes, it is still hot. All oh, this... Twisted metal. It nearly cost me my life. Still, you live to tell the tale. Have you seen the inspector? Uh, just over there, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you. You'll have to mind when you tread, sir. Yes, I shall be careful. Ah, Holmes. I've been taking a stroll around the grounds just to see what I could see. Did you find anything? Only the reason why you lost no more than your thumb at the hands of Colonel Lysander Stark. The ground where you fell unconscious is quite soft and there were some quite distinct impressions, including two sets of footprints leading down to the road. It would seem, happily, that you were carried there by two persons, one of whom had remarkably small feet and the other unusually large ones. More than likely that would be Ferguson. Probably didn't want to risk a murder charge, so he helped the woman get you out of harm's way, Mr. Hatherley. And I suppose I should be grateful to him. Better bring another hose up. Well, this has been a pretty business for me. I nearly lost my life, and I've certainly lost my thumb and a 50-guinea fee. But you have gained experience. Which I would gladly have forgone. Ah, but indirectly, it may be of value. You have only to put your experience into words to gain the reputation of being excellent company for the remainder of your existence. <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, even if that should not prove to be the case, I must thank you, gentlemen, for all the trouble you've taken on my behalf. No, no, not at all. Now, if you will excuse me, I feel I should return to London as soon as possible. Or well, who knows, I may have another client waiting for Perhaps me. Perhaps I should travel with you. I don't doubt you may still be feeling the effects of your experience. Thank you, Doctor, but I shall manage perfectly well. As you wish. But stop by the surgery tonight, so I can change the dressing. I will. Now, I really must hurry. I believe there's a train due shortly. Good day to you all. Good day, Mr. Hadley. Take care of yourself. A sadder, but it is to be hoped a much wiser young man. Well, Inspector, have you had more luck than I? Possibly, Mr. Holmes. We have a witness who saw a cart containing three people and some very bulky boxes driving rapidly in the direction of Reading early this morning. 
We pursued our inquiries there, of course, but the trail seems to have gone cold. We also found considerable quantities of nickel and tin stored in one of the outhouses. No coin, unfortunately. Probably in those boxes. More than likely. It's back to Bradstreet. Oh, now what? Uh... Yes, Fielding? Can we move the metal now, sir? Uh, I'll come down. Um, did you want to examine it, Mr Holmes? Later, perhaps. I'll have it sent down to the station. Then. A moment, Inspector. I have one small piece of evidence for you. Oh, what's that, Mr Holmes? This. Holmes. It was found by one of the firemen upon a window sill on the second floor. Perhaps I should have returned it to Mr Hatherley, but then I doubt if he's any further need of it, despite his previous attachment. Bradstreet. Uh, thank you, Mr Holmes. Well, this had better go to the station as well. Fielding? Well, Holmes, what now? To Reading? See if we can catch up with them? Little point, I fear. They've had far too good a start. So, what do you suggest? What I suggest, my dear fellow, is that with all possible speed we remove ourselves to the local inn. We may yet be in time to sample some of the good Berkshire beef the constable has so heartily recommended. Although our trip to Berkshire did not produce the tangible result Holmes had undoubtedly wished for, I, for one, still savoured the taste of the succulent slices that were placed before us that day. I have no knowledge as to whether the hydraulic engineer acted on Holmes' advice for capitalising on his most singular experience or not. However, a week after our return, Holmes did receive a note from Hatherley thanking him for his assistance and inviting him to forward his accounts for services rendered. Needless to say, Holmes did not comply with this request. As for the sinister Colonel Lysander Stark, his assistant Ferguson, and the beautiful German woman, to all intents and purposes, they simply vanished off the face of the earth, and nothing has been heard of them from that day to this. For his part, Holmes never referred to the matter again. Understandable, of course. Few people like to be reminded of their failures, although, in this case, lack of success would be nearer the mark but I doubt if Holmes would acknowledge or accept the distinction. In The Engineer's Thumb, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Merrison and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams. Victor Hatherley was played by Stephen Tomkinson and Colonel Lysander Stark by John Moffat. With Sybil Winthrop as Elise, David Googe as Inspector Bradstreet, Vincent Brimble as Ferguson and Constable Fielding, and Paul Downing as the Railway Guard and the Fireman. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Engineer's Thumb was dramatised for radio by Peter Mackey and directed by Patrick Rayner.